Welcome to the Sheffield series, Lessons in Leadership. Today our guest is Dan Reddix, the current headmaster of Dilworth School. Dan is a highly respected leader in the sector. He is progressive and passionate in the area of boys' education and is well known for his strong values-led leadership style. Dan has led Dilworth through a challenging period, providing stability and inspiration to the community, while at the same time developing outstanding learning opportunities for its students. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Ian. Welcome to Sheffield's uh, series, Lessons in Leadership. It's wonderful to, to have you as a, uh, an outstanding leader, particularly in New Zealand's education sector. So thank you for joining us and, and thank you for your willingness to, to share your leadership story. It's a pleasure. It's good to be here. Uh, Dan, just to kick off, it, it would be good to get a, a sense for what have been the most influential um, influences in shaping your leadership style over time? Uh, I, I think like most of us, um, well, probably like all of us, we're, we're shaped uh, to an extent by a combination of variables and, and experiences and, and people. So if I, if I think specifically through a leadership lens, there are probably three main things that have, that have shaped the style that, that I think I've developed. Uh, and probably in the infancy, it was observation um, and experience of, of leaders uh, when I was a subordinate. Uh, and, and I think about some of those who are incredibly effective and some who are relatively ineffective. Uh, and, and the ability to be able to isolate and identify distinguishing characteristics of effective leaders. And, and as I think about that, I think about Dave Sims, who was my, my first boss at uh, Palmerston North Boys, and I would have followed him over broken glass. Uh, you know, really, really strong leadership, clear vision and direction, uh, and gave me the great, great opportunities to actually develop myself professionally and personally. And so I guess you learn to take... Um, the, the strengths from different people's tutelage uh, and apply those in practice um, in, in an authentic way for yourself in the context you're in. And probably equally as importantly uh, is to make sure you don't fall into the behaviours and practices uh, of those who, who were ineffective. And so uh, I, I think looking back and observing and experiencing leaders when I was a subordinate was one thing that, that sort of forged my leadership style. Uh, the second has to be lived experience. And, and I know from most of my reading and research, you know, 70% of our learning is done on the job. Uh, and, and I've certainly learned a lot through being a leader about how to be a better leader. And, and the richest learning, unfortunately, came in the most painful parts as I reflect on my own failures and my own disappointments uh, and consider how I might have acted or responded or spoken differently uh, to, to arrive at a different conclusion or outcome. So the lived experience, I think, has been really critical. Uh, and, and probably the third piece, like most of us, um, you know, I, I do quite a bit of literature review and reading and in, in pursuit of trying to get better. Uh, and, and I personally come from a, a very strong faith base. And so while I've, while I've read multiple authors, I really enjoy the work of John C. Maxwell. Uh, and, and I like his ability to be able to blend biblical principles into, into practical leadership. And, and as I reflect on the life of Jesus, I, you know, probably the ultimate example of a servant leader. Um, someone who was full of compassion and care for people, but also led in a really balanced way. Uh, so, you know, on the one hand, he says to his disciples, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And on the other hand, he's casting the money changes out of the temple and, you know, confronting the religious leaders about their hypocrisy. And so I, I guess it's a it's an amalgam of, of those three things that, that I think have helped shape uh, the leader I am today and, and no doubt will help me become a better leader as I as I progress. As you've observed effective and less effective leaders, have there been any effective leaders outside of the education sector that um, either have impressed you or have taught you? Uh, none, none really spring to mind um, that, that I've really had close connections with and therefore have really understood um, the the intricacies, I guess, of their leadership. There, there are some people, you know, you see those those people who are willing uh, to take a stand, to do the hard, 
to to front things that are really challenging with integrity and 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 you see those little pockets and and those people and their leadership resonates with me um, but probably none that I've really I've done a deep dive with and said that person has actually had a significant impact uh, on you know my my leadership style and and, and how I've derived uh, my my leadership you know capacity and skill Picking up on your your lived experience as well as um, sort of Maxwell's um, teachings and, and 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 biblical teachings, have you been able to narrow? And I'll 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 put the number five out there for you. Have you been able to narrow your leadership approach to five key principles that that got that guide your style? I think I can come up with maybe four. <laughs> so I might I might not hit the mark, and and, and that's okay. It's, it's not right. about. It's not it's not about perfection. Um, <laughs> I, I look, I think the first one is is invest in people first and most, and 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 I think that is that is something I have learned. I probably understood that, uh, but that has just been strengthened every every you know experience I've had as a leader. And and the Maori the Maori proverb, "Hey aha te me nui." Uh, or Teo, you know, what, what's the most important thing in the world? Uh, and of course, the answer, hey tangata, hey tangata, hey tangata, it's the people, the people, the people. And and what that means to me in my context is emotionally uh, and, and personally, uh, and then professionally, uh, connecting and investing uh, with my colleagues. And, and in my context, it also means building meaningful and purposeful relationships with students. Uh, and ideally, both sets through my interaction with them feel valued, appreciated, and cared for. And and as as I reflect on a lot of ed- educational institutions, particularly those ones that are slightly larger in scale or those that have multiple campuses like mine, uh, it, it's a very real threat that you can become disconnected with the people. Uh, and and the people are the ones who really are giving feet uh, to the to the vision and embedding the values. And if there's a disconnect between leadership uh, and and those on the floor, then then you've got real issues. Uh, and and I think as I reflect on my leadership journey, uh, it's been characterised by significant change management, both the roles that, that I've had, uh, and and you learn really quickly that effective leadership uh, and effective change management isn't about building really nice, pretty buildings. It's not about having more resources. It's not about a better bottom line. It's actually about building a culture of excellence and consistent high performance and high expectations. And that's all about people. Uh, so I, I think invest in people first and most would be principle number one. Uh, principle number two, uh, for me, would just be being authentic. And and I have I have learned that I'm actually at my best when I'm being me. Uh, and I... I guess, again, I learn because this wasn't natural when I started. I've learned to dispense with pretense uh, and stop trying to prove how worthy I am to other people or how good I am at my job. Uh, and and when I started, I, I struggled with a bit of an imposter syndrome. I remember, I remember sitting at my desk thinking, when are they going to figure out I don't actually know what I'm doing? <laughs> um, and and so as, as a consequence, it's really easy to overcompensate by trying to be something you think you're expected to be rather than being who you are and, and let your strengths shine. Uh, and and the other thing I've learned very quickly in this industry, young people are incredibly perceptive and astute. Uh, and if you're inauthentic, uh, they, they see through you straight away and you lose all credibility. And I think on balance, I would also say that more than a leader's competency, what my staff want is to be led by someone they trust and, and who they know is going to be consistent in their behaviors and their attitudes. And when you're actually being yourself uh, and you're being authentic, then they know what that looks like. They know what they're going to get. They know how you're going to react. And that gives them a certainty and confidence that they are certainly in search of as as staff members. So being authentic would be number two. Uh, probably my my third one is the one that uh, I'm, I'm really adamant about, and, and that is just to be convicted. Uh, and, and this is one of the defining principles for me in, in my leadership. And, and for me, being convicted means that I believe wholeheartedly in what I'm doing, uh, that I believe in its importance and its worth. And it's probably synonymous with, you know, having a role that has a moral purpose. But for me, conviction is probably speaking with a little more intensity even than just having a moral purpose. 
And, and I've decided in my leadership that the moment I'm not convicted about what I'm doing, it's time for me to leave. Uh, and as I reflect on conviction, I think the reason why it's so important is that without it, we won't tend to make the hard decisions or walk the hard roads or hold the hard lines uh, when they need to be held. It's, it's much easier to opt for the path of less resistance or, or least resistance. And I, I think the other thing about conviction that, that is actually quite nice is it helps me sleep at night. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and one of the great tensions when you're in leadership is you're making decisions all the time that adversely affect people. You know, it's, it's very seldom that I'll make a decision where everyone's happy. Uh, and, and I think knowing that the decisions I'm making uh, are coming from uh, a place of conviction uh, actually just, just makes the negative impact a little more palatable and manageable for me. And so I, I sleep pretty well, despite the fact I've made some challenging decisions when they're rooted in, in that conviction. So that makes sense? That makes absolute sense. Uh, and, and probably the fourth one for me then outside of conviction uh, is, is pursue exceptional. And, and I, have, I have a great residual belief in the young people I work with. Uh, I think most of them don't understand how incredibly capable they are and what capacity they have. Uh, and I acknowledge their best looks different for every one of them. Uh, but in their own way, they're exceptional. And, and they can be exceptional. So I'm not interested in pursuing or settling for mediocrity. Uh, I'm not interested in why we can't or, or why students can't, but how we can and how they can. Uh, and, and I guess on a personal level, I try to be exceptional. I, I try to hold myself to a higher standard and I, I don't always succeed that, but that's my intent. Um, and, and then I ask my staff to be exceptional because that's what my young men deserve. And then I expect my young men to be exceptional, to be the best version of themselves, because what's the point in living a life of mediocrity? I, uh, I, don't, I don't want them uh, to leave the song inside of them unsung. Uh, and and I, I share with the boys often the words of Nelson Mandela, and I love this quote, you know, he said, there's no passion to be found playing small and settling for a life that's less than the one you're capable of living. Uh, so... Uh, pursuing exceptional, and, and I guess the, the important part there about pursuing exceptional is, is that it's not pursuing perfection. Uh, and this is, this is one, of the, one of the great learnings of my life because I have perfectionist tendencies. Uh, and what I've found in pursuing perfection is there is by default a lack of balance. Uh, I, there tends to be a lack of grace uh, and, and, and an absence of celebration because all you tend to look for is uh, how we can be better and how we can improve. And that's actually reasonably destructive in a, in a, in a working climate uh, and, and for people who are investing everything they've got. So um, it's, it's one of the things that, that I have changed. I probably, if I, if I think about my early days, I was about pursuing perfection. Uh, now I'm content with exceptional and happy to, happy to celebrate when we get close. Uh, and, and keep striving for that. So I, I would think they are the they are probably the four key drivers, um, and and the, the principles that I try to embrace in, in my leadership. Those uh, just recent comments um, lead me to reflect on the degree of change and transformation that you've led both at Kings uh, in in Dunedin and at, at Dilworth, and presumably along along that journey. Uh, there have been significant learnings which have meant that your leadership style has adapted or changed to, to, to what the circumstances demand. So it's that balance of here are my four principles, but sometimes there are, there are situations that de- demand a, a, a different approach. Uh, how have those, how have leading those periods of change adapted or, or changed your style in any way? Yeah. It- it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because if, if I reflect on both of the roles, uh, they, have, they have just been characterized by substantive change and rapid change. Mm. And, and, and the reason why the change has been rapid is, is because when you're looking to improve student outcomes and achievement, there is no time to waste. There is a, there is a natural urgency 
uh, that, that has to that has to be present and has to exist. And and both projects, um, both roles have have required a complete reset of the entire organisation. So, really, most facets operationally and strategically, there, there's been a, a huge amount of disruption. Um, so so that's that's required some some flexibility uh, in in terms of my leadership. But but I think mostly that has been in in the last three years uh, in my in my role at Dilworth. Uh, the, the role at Kings, I think I was growing into my leadership, uh, and and there were some some rough edges that certainly needed to be smoothed, and and some changes that I made. But I, I think the the redesign of Dilworth, the entire school from the ground up. Obviously, we've been confronted with significant horror, uh, historical abuse issues. Uh, and then we've had the impacts of COVID in an all boarding environment. Um, the, the changes have been have been pretty epic, really. Um, so while I've been used to a changing environment, this is this has sort of been uh, change at, a, at another pace and on another level. So I think if I if I was to isolate some of the things that that I've changed in my practice in the last uh, two years, particularly, I, I have become more flexible uh, with with staff working hours and geographical location for their work. Uh, obviously, my teachers still need to be on site, but I've got a reasonable proportion uh, of my non-teaching staff who can actually do some of their work from home. Uh, and, and that's been reasonably challenging for me because it's, it's a relinquishing of control uh, and, it, and it's a really high trust model, but it's actually worked really, really favorably. So uh, I've, I've found that to be positive and certainly so have, so have those colleagues who have been working from home. Um, probably against my uh, my natural, uh, <laughs> my natural instinct. I have become a little more relaxed and and a little more realistic about some outputs, uh, knowing that it's a pretty challenging time for everyone. Uh, and you know, even as we sort of weave our way through the back end of COVID, things still haven't quite corrected. Everyone's not quite where they were, and you know, even talking to to colleagues in education, but in industries outside, everyone's fatigued, mm -hmm. uh, and and so. I've had to adjust some performance targets and, and reset some strategic priorities. And, and, I, and I certainly haven't pushed as hard as I might have uh, in different circumstances. And so, you know, for me, that's just being a dialing back, which, which is a bit of a challenge, uh, but has been necessary. And probably the, I think the most prominent change has just been an acknowledgement that staff and student well-being actually needs to be at the forefront of my thinking and program design. Uh, and so we've worked really hard to, to make sure our staff are okay, uh, the boys are okay, and wrapped a lot of support and care around them. And that has been a real active focus. And, and, and I wouldn't say it, it has been um, neglected previously, but it's, it's just become a much higher priority uh, and, and changed a lot of our practice, you know, within my leadership team, but also, you know, in the, in the wider school body and, and the wider staff body. You're known as being a strong, and you have been um, over time, a strong proponent of um, boys' education and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and building boys' self-confidence in terms of the, the future and building, building skills and um, a, a, a unique identity around being male. Um, how has that influenced your... Um, Sort of your approach in both your rector and headmaster role. What 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 have you done to uh, in, enhance that focus, and why is it important? Yeah, it's it's an interesting environment our young men walk into, and uh, there there needs to be a a sense within them that they're okay. Who they are and and the particular group i work with are boys and so understanding what it actually means uh to be a man is is critically important uh and and in the world they are confronted with which is a far more complex one than i was uh the, the ideas around manhood and masculinity are so incredibly varied uh and and they are exposed to so many different social media channels that they must be incredibly confused about what it looks like to be a good man. How, and how do I actually function uh, in this world as a man? And so I think that's, that's, part of, that's part of our responsibility is to make sure we help our boys understand 
what it means to be a good man, what that looks like. Uh, I was I was speaking to our leavers uh, on Thursday night, and and I shared with them the the words that um, King David said to his son Solomon when he was on his deathbed, uh, and and he and he basically said to him, um, "Be courageous," you know. And, and I said to the boys, "Look, courage. It's it's not about jumping out of an airplane, but it's actually about having the courage to be yourself, to to be the person you are meant to be in the world." And and then David said, "Show yourself a man." Uh, and so I, I said to our boys, "What does it actually mean to be a man?" Well, it, it means, you know, uh, in in twenty in twenty twenty two for the Dilworth man, it's it's still what did James Dilworth want? He wanted us to be good and useful members of society, and and a and a Dilworth man is embracing our core values of respect and integrity, you know, and compassion and service and excellence, and and those messages, if we're not delivering them, often aren't being deposited in our boys' hearts and their lives. And, and so when they come to those critical moments in their lives and their crossroads uh, and they search the warehouse of their hearts, if those things haven't been deposited, they haven't got anything to draw on. They haven't got anything, you know, to 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 root themselves back in. Uh, and, and therefore, they make choices that possibly are going to be to their detriment. And so that's why I think it's really important that we're actually teaching them what it looks like uh, to be a good man. Uh, and, and he finishes by saying, you know, and... And, and go and, and go and serve God. And I acknowledge that not all, all of our boys have a faith position and that's fine, but I want them to understand that they are loved and valued, you know, just the way they are. And I think that's critically important. Uh, we're not in a position to love others and care for them until we learn that we're loved uh, and we learn to love ourselves. Uh, so so it's, it's sort of a bit of a fluid answer, Ian, but uh, I, those those are the reasons why actually helping our boys understand what it means to be a man are critical. And... You know, that's why you talk about a holistic education. The, the learning in the classroom is important. I would argue the values uh, that we're able to, to give them as a foundation are probably more important. You've, you've talked a little bit about the pressures uh, and stresses that are on young people today. Uh, and I'm just interested, as you look outside of the classroom and outside of the school, what are the global trends that interest and concern you most uh, in terms of the the pressures on young people and and why why do you choose those particular things to to talk specifically about yeah i mean obviously i've just touched on technology mm. and and technological trends and so if, if i if i look from an educational lens that the technological trends in teaching and learning uh, are quite interesting and and so there's an obvious shift and a push for the integration of, of technology and teaching and learning, and that's entirely sensible and reasonable. Uh, probably my concern when I think about that uh, is what you've already touched on, and that is uh, our boys' exposure to, to technology, and, and I would argue an overexposure. But also the idea of this, this prominent philosophy that really teachers should primarily be facilitators. And, and you know, I was, I was reading a, a piece yesterday saying that uh, the the total number of pages in Wiki in the last 20 years have risen from 10,000 to 250 million. And, and there's a philosophy and a thinking, a, a school of thought that says, well, teachers should just actually assist students to access information because there's so much information out there. Uh, but what we know about young people and boys in particular, and this is, this is coming back to what works for boys, is our relational learners. So our, our young men's learning experience is, is determined by a great, to a great extent by their connection with their teacher. And the international research, uh, that, that certainly um, bears that out. But we don't have to look any further than the COVID debacle uh, where we were, we were trying to teach our boys online. And I say debacle because it was. Uh, without human connectivity for a protracted period of time, it doesn't work. Because young people don't have the maturation, they don't have the intrinsic motivation to be self-starters and self-sustaining. Some do, but they're a minority. And so that's a bit of a concern for me. We we can't. I think we would be in serious error if we if we thought the teacher would be replaced by the technology, because learning is relational for for these young people, and they and they need that connection. And I think the other the other thing around education, the other shift. That, that is in the wind and has been for a while is the move from instructional teaching to self-directed teaching and learning model. Uh, and, and there's no doubt again, 
that that student agency and allowing students to be collaborative and involved in co-construction of learning opportunities is advantageous for them and, and it creates more engagement. But again, it's when you take those practices to an extreme that they actually become problematic. Uh, and, and we shouldn't be dispensing with instructional teaching, but we should be making sure we balance it with self-directed learning. And, and the balance always is determined by the age and the stage and the capability of the learner who actually requires quite a degree of autonomy uh, when they're involved in, in self-directed teaching. And so my fear is what we have a tendency to do is we swing too far in one direction only to overcorrect in the other direction. Uh, and I think the other, the other global trends I'm interested in, particularly around education, is uh, the thinking around creating a school curriculum and learning opportunities that, that promote and develop creativity uh, and doing that in a really intentional and purposeful and designed way rather than it being accidental or incidental. And so that's one of the things that, that I'm quite interested in exploring as we move forward is, is how do we actually give life and breath to, to creativity in, in, a, in a meaningful way. And I guess if I step back and I think about us as an educational institution and, you know, some of the, some of the strategic things we have to consider, uh, if, if you look at the, over the last 30 years, the, the increased mobility of people between countries, you know, we've got uh, a, a really significantly different international migrant stock. Uh, and, and we talk a lot in, in education about, about being culturally competent. So understanding the learners that are in front of us and make sure we're responding to them, that's going to be a strategic challenge for us. Uh, and it's been interesting moving from Dunedin to Auckland and, and just the complete change in, in the ethnic makeup uh, mm -hmm. of the students that, that we have the privilege of working with and how we need to adapt our teaching to that. So I think that's going to be interesting. Um, I think the, you know, the, the, the situation with the, the world and the planet uh, and we've been told since the 1970s that our, our ecological footprint has consistently exceeded, you know, the Earth's biocapacity. What does that mean for us as humanity? And then what does that mean for us as educators? So how, how are we going about changing the narrative and maybe changing our practice uh, with our students? So that's, again, a strategic consideration. And we've actually just introduced a, um, a sustainability uh, curriculum course in year seven and eight. And we'll look to drive that through the school. So just just again, an awareness of that. And probably the other global trend that's quite interesting, <laughs> I think about my parents and um, they had two jobs uh, over, over their careers and, and my dad had two employers, uh, one being himself. And, and what we learn now is that uh, our, the students who are currently leaving this year are likely to have 17 different employers on average mm -hmm. uh, and five different career paths. Uh, and you, you sort of, you weave that together with, the research and Microsoft are saying uh, there'll be 190 million new jobs created by 2025. 149 million of those will be in the digital space. You know, so so what are we doing uh, to to actually respond to those global trends? Uh, a, a really really mobile labour market and and a and one that's changing at a very quick rate. How how do we make sure that what we're doing isn't redundant? Um, so so they'd be the trends that I'd be interested in that and that are probably driving some of our strategic thinking. Thank you. Uh, Dan, uh, both your role at King's and your, your current role is um, a high profile and they're stressful and they're 24-7 you know, jobs. The, 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 the pressure is never off. What personal strategies do you employ to ensure that you um, stay focused, you stay healthy? Um, not only for the organization's success, but for your own personal well-being. Mm. Look, it's, it's easy with the, the disruption and all the, the change going on to lose sight. Um, and so if I, if I talk initially about the organization, so it's easy to lose sight of what we're really about. Um, and, and look, probably the, the, there's no greater example than that in the last three years. You know, there's been every opportunity for us to be distracted from our core purpose. So I, I do some really, some really basic um, personal things. So I have a copy of our school vision uh, and it sits on my desk. And so what I'm able to do is I'm dealing with things that really distract from the key purposes. I'm able to center myself in what we're really about. And that's, you know, developing young men of good character who are pursuing personal excellence, who, who are going to flourish in life. And it's really important for me to draw myself back to that. And there are two other things that probably go hand in hand with that. I, I received a letter when I left King's uh, three and a half years ago from a student that I taught there. 
um, quite a few years prior. Uh, and it's the most, it was the most emotional letter that I've ever received. And, and it took me about, well, it took me about six months to get through it without crying. Uh, and he was just writing about the difference that I'd made in his life. And so that letter sits in my top drawer. Uh, and, and I just occasionally, and I'm getting a bit emotional now, I occasionally go in there and just read that letter and go, that's what, that's what it's all about. Uh, and the third thing is actually, I'm just going to shift my camera here. Mm. On my wall, you'll be able to see my Liverpool flag. All right. So <laughs> all right. the Liverpool flag is there for two reasons. One, I am an absolute mad uh, mm. Liverpool fan. And they are the finest football side in Europe. Of that, there is no doubt. Um, but the real the real reason why it's there is is not to antagonise the Manchester United fans. It's it's basically when I was ten years old, uh, my dream was to play professional football for Liverpool, and I did everything I could to achieve that and fell very very short. <laughs> but I leave the flag there to remind me every morning when I walk in that actually that's my business. Uh, it's to help young men dream and then help them facilitate their dreams. And so those those little triggers for me make actually quite a big difference. They they help me stay centered. Um, and then there are some, I guess, some more sort of pragmatic things. So I've got a copy of our annual plan. I commit to going through that every every month, uh, and I'm looking at those strategic pillars and make sure that we're not deviating from those overarching goals, uh, and we're not getting lost in the weeds. But also revising the strategy, making sure that you know it doesn't need tweaking or overhauling. Uh, we've we've got some uh, agreed. Uh, deal with principles for learning. And, and there are two that are really at the heart of that, and that's honouring Te Tiriti or Waitangi, uh, and also making sure that students are at the centre. And so what I make sure I do is every time I'm making a decision, I test it against those primary principles. Is this actually in the best interest of the students? And if it's not, then I need to reconsider the decision. And so they help me, they help me stay online and focused. Uh, I've got uh, a handful of really trusted senior leaders. And I don't like to surround myself with yes people. Uh, I really like people who will challenge me and who will give me critical feedback. And I've got that. And that's I, I think that's a bit of a luxury, but it's great. Uh, and so I'm quite often able to test the thinking and direction that I'm, that I'm thinking about heading in with them. Uh, and they'll give me good feedback. And they're also a pretty good lit litmus test on the climate of the school uh, and, and the school culture. And I think personally... Uh, to to keep myself in a good space, I and I have learned this uh, as I've sort of uh, battled from time to time with fluctuating weight, and and weight for me is around that's it's a it's a pretty good signal of of where I'm at. Uh, so when I get stressed uh, or I'm really busy, uh, I tend to eat, and the first thing I forsake is my exercise. That's not a great combination. Uh, so what I've learned to do is change my eating, which is a bit more of a challenge. Uh, and then I'm exercising on a regular basis. So, for example, at the moment, Tuesday, Thursdays, I don't come to work till nine o'clock. Uh, I go to the gym and make sure I've got two workouts in, and then I work out Saturday, Sunday. And so that's been great. And and probably my best sounding board for personal success is my wife. Uh, and she's really good at making sure that my life is not being utterly absorbed and engulfed by work. Uh, so uh, she's great at just sort of saying, "Hey, where, where are things at?" Um, and how are we going? I haven't seen you for a few nights, uh, and it's and it's nice just to recenter. And and again, we've committed to um, uh, a date during the week, uh, and so you know I'll leave this afternoon at four o'clock, and we'll go and have a coffee, uh, and then we we make sure we're out once in the weekend. So uh, that's just to try and provide some balance because you're right; otherwise, it's relentless and all consuming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Uh, the, the the final question, which I always find an interesting one, which is. Uh, in hindsight, uh, if you could give yourself a piece of good leadership advice at the beginning of your career, mm. now knowing what you know, mm. what would it be? Uh, mine would be that no one is indispensable, and especially me. And and I and I think the reason why that, <laughs> I think that's important. It would have saved me a lot of heartache, and maybe some poor decision making along the way. And I remember when I started my leadership career in my first job, uh, I, I was really affected for the first three or four years when people who I thought were pivotal to the organization uh, left. And, and, I, and I remember losing sleep, and I don't do that often. Uh, and, and after a while, I started to realize that actually everyone is replaceable. 
no one's indispensable. They may not be a like for like replacement, but as long as you're recruiting quality people, they bring their own unique strengths and they'll and they'll make the organization better in their own way. And so there's been quite a shift when I've realized that as I look at my staff and now I'm actually really committed to making sure they progress, to make sure they're the best version of themselves, to give them everything they need to to succeed. And my only expectation of them is that they'll give 100% uh, while they're with me. But probably the piece that was most important in terms of that advice is to recognize that I'm not indispensable. And what that has enabled me to do is carry the burden and responsibility of leadership a lot lighter. Uh, so it's I've got a much more soft touch with my responsibilities now than I had before. Because I think initially, and I say initially, I'm talking probably five years, I, I really thought it all rested on me. Uh, and and that created quite an unhealthy mindset and some unhealthy work habits, to be perfectly honest. Uh, and what you realize pretty quickly, you know, I, I did 11 years at King's uh, and you leave and naturally enough, they replace you with someone else. Uh, and people might for a brief period speak fondly of your contribution. Uh, but pretty quickly, they adjust to the new leader they, and you become a bit of a distant memory. And that's as it should be. But what that helps me do is realize that actually I need to keep some life balance. And, and it reminds me that I shouldn't pour everything of myself into my job at the exclusion of the things that are truly important. And that's the people I love. So if I could, if I could go, it could have gone back to the 33 year old Dan, I would have said to him, no one's indispensable. And particularly that relates to you. Now that's very healthy advice and um, an important learning. Dan, thank you very much for your time. It's been a delight speaking with you as, as it is always. Um, the, the, um, the, the lessons you've provided uh, this morning um, will be um, listened to uh, and heeded with interest by our, our wide audience. Uh, and um, I'm thankful for your time and the thoughtfulness that you've put into your answers. Thanks very much. Thanks Ian, it's been a privilege. Thank you.